Harold Winter here. I'm the pastor of Cross Point Community Church, and I'm really excited that you have joined us for this worship service uh, in this format. We're thankful for those that worship with us uh, regularly. And if this is the first time you've seen us on TV or are tuning into our YouTube channel, welcome. We're really glad that you've taken this time to worship God and to listen to the gospel of Jesus Christ. I pray that this is a blessing to you. This is the part of the service where I get to talk about some of the ministries that we have at Cross Point Community Church and some of the places where the deacons encourage us to send donations. And so here in Cross Point, um, we're really happy that the lockdown in Ontario is over. And this Sunday morning, we uh, were able to worship in the sanctuary uh, with a number of people who uh, wanted to come. Uh, of course, at this point, our nursery is not able to be opened and our Sunday school classes are not meeting. Though some people have been bringing their kids anyhow, and we've set up stations, tables around the sanctuary for those with little kids, that uh, the kids can be involved in some of the activities that are made available for them there and still participate in the worship service and enjoy the singing and as much of the teaching as they can at their age as well. It's a neat thing that kids are always listening. Um, we're also really happy that this week our Alpha ministry will resume. On Thursday evening, a number of guys will be gathering here in the sanctuary to watch the next Alpha video and to have a discussion about some of the topics that get raised there. So thank you for supporting those ministries and uh, praying for the outreach of Cross Point Community Church. We also are... Um, able to support other ministries. And one of them this week that the deacons asked me to highlight is for New Life Prison Ministries. This is a correspondence ministry for people who are in prison, who are interested in doing a Bible study. They get the course mailed to them lesson by lesson, and each time they fill out the answers to a lesson, the exam, they send that back to uh, New Life Prison Ministries, and they get a letter and their corrected uh, work back to them. The letter is provided by a volunteer who writes a personally addressed letter and engages the, uh, the student in some dialogue that way. This is a ministry that we like to support so that it, these lessons can be made available to people who are in prison free of charge. 
I want to thank you, though. Thank you for your support for the ministries of our congregation and for helping us to build up the kingdom of God and to do the work that God has laid out for us to make more and better disciples who are a blessing in the communities where we live. Thanks. This is the point in the service where I'd like to invite you to a time of prayer. Um, one of the things I'd like to invite you to pray about is uh, the leadership of our church family. Uh, I'm the pastor, but there are elders and there are deacons in our congregation as well. And we are in a selection process for people to take over those, those roles, for elders who are people who spend time visiting within our congregation and setting the direction of our church family, supervising things like worship services and other ministries, and also looking for new deacons, people whose role is to make possible the charity work of our church family, as well as to keep an eye on other finances and to encourage and give gifts to people that will build them up and help them on their journey. And so please, in your daily week as well, remember, in your, day, in your days ahead, remember to pray for this process. Please join me in our talking with God. Heavenly Father, we're really thankful for the way that you have cared for us and provided for us. We're thankful for this time of worship and that we can be quiet before you and to remember who you are and your role in this creation, both as the maker of everything and as the one who rescued and redeemed and renews your own creation. We pray that as we meet with you now, we can have a sense of your closeness, of your deep love for us, your deep love for your creation. Thank you for the way that you are caring for us. <laughs> We're thankful for answered prayer that a vaccine, a number of vaccines are available for COVID-19. We ask for your help and you've answered that way. We pray as well that that can be made available to many people again this week and that you slow down, preferably stop the spread of COVID-19 right now. And also that you help us as we deal with all the effects, the ways that it has affected our jobs and our work, our studying and our anxiety levels. We pray for our students and teachers, for those who go to school at Westfield Public School and Glendale here in town, the high school. And we pray that the students and teachers there can enjoy a sense of peace, that they can learn and that they can grow. We pray also for Woodstock Christian School and for London Christian High, that as students from our congregation go to these places as well, that these can be places where kids are safe, and where kids lo learn and grow and are stretched, and that you bless the teachers there as well. And we're thankful for the colleges and universities that are so readily available too. Again, it looks like a very different semester for those that are in college and university. We pray for those that are experiencing loneliness, for those that are struggling with mental illness, and for those that just struggle to learn under these conditions. Will you be close? Will you be a shelter, a protector, a safe place and for those that are going through difficult times. And we pray for those that are thriving right now as well. Really thankful that you can help us grow and stretch and learn. We're thankful as well, Heavenly Father, for uh, the um, public health services and public safety net that's available. We're thankful for the way that there are hospitals and uh, healthcare workers and ambulances and other emergency services. These are gifts of yours uh, by which you help us and protect us. And we're really thankful for them as well. Be with those that are working in these areas. Give them strength and safety and wisdom and fill them with compassion. Relieve their stress and anxiety, we pray. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the way that you care for people within our community, for those that are seniors and for those that are widowed. We pray for your closeness to those that feel lonely 
and cut off from family and friends. For those who are in long-term care, we pray for protection, and for safety, but also for a feeling of being loved, uh, your closeness especially, but also for connection with other people. A lot of people are really hunger, hungering and, and thirsting for contact with other people. We pray that that can be made available soon. We're thankful for our church and for the leadership and direction that you give us. We're thankful for the way that we can connect with people in our community. We're thankful for people who have gathered for worship on Sunday within the sanctuary. It's really neat that that's made possible again. And we pray for those that are in leadership, not just for the pastor, but also for the current elders and the current deacons, but also in the process that we're engaged in to select new office bearers, new elders and new deacons who can pick up those roles later on in the spring. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for hearing our cares and our concerns, and thank you for being the one who fulfills the desires of our hearts in ways that we can only, well, can only dream about and yet see coming into, into focus. We pray now as we also bring our own quiet thanks and petitions Hear what we're concerned about. Hear those that we're concerned for. And answer our prayers as you promise always, always, always to do. Because you've made it possible for us to talk to you directly through Jesus, our rescuer, redeemer, and savior. Amen. to read from God's Word now. You may recall as a congregation we're reading through Mark's Gospel. You could read it in a couple hours this afternoon from chapter 1 to chapter 16 if you wanted to. Or you could read along with us, sign up for an email to get sent to you each weekday that involves a few verses and some thoughts and some prayer suggestions. This morning, we're looking at a passage from Mark chapter 1 that we looked at earlier this week. Let's read together starting at verse 21 from Mark's gospel, chapter 1. They, that is Jesus and his disciples, went to Capernaum. And when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. Just then a man from their synagogue who was possessed by an impure spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, said Jesus sternly. Come out of him. The impure spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. The people were all so amazed that they asked each other, What is this? A new teaching and with authority. He even gives orders to impure spirits and they obey him. News about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. Having read God's word, let's pray and ask for God to help us to understand it. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for your word. And we pray that that we have ears to hear what it has to say to us as people who are intrigued and growing in faith in Jesus Christ. We pray that we can hear and recognize the good news of Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. And we pray that as we meditate on it now, that you will come powerfully to allow us to hear and to apply this word to our lives, to our situation, and to find that is good news of great joy for all people. Hear us and answer us, for we come in Jesus' name. Amen. Have you read some of Dr. Zeus's books? He published, give or take, 60 titles, and most of them were written for kids, though there's a couple adult books as well. You know some of the titles, don't you? Horton, Here's a Who, 
One fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish, the cat in the hat, or green eggs and ham. His silly rhymes and his cartoon characters and those fantastical buildings that don't seem to work in any way, shape, or form, well, these drawings made him popular for generations and generations of little kids. He started publishing in the late 1930s, after all. But you might be wondering, what does Dr. Zeus have to do with this account of Jesus teaching and healing in a synagogue in Capernaum so long ago? Here's the connection. I must have read The Cat in the Hat a thousand times for each one of my kids. And I read that book so often that I even turned it over and read the blurb on the back of the book. And on the back of that book, there's a quote from the Detroit Free Press in November of 1966. Somebody by the name of Ellen Goodman wrote about Dr. Zeus and his book, The Cat in the Hat. She said this, Ten years ago, Dr. Zeus took 220 words, rhymed them, and turned out The Cat in the Hat, a little volume of absurdity that worked like a karate chop on the weary little world of Dick, Jane, and Spot. Here's the connection. And it seems that that karate chop on a weary world is exactly what Jesus does when he goes and he preaches in Capernaum's synagogue with authority. That karate chop on a weary world of tired authority and uninspired preaching. I mean, Jesus didn't teach like the other teachers. Jesus taught with authority, Mark points out. What does that sound like? Uh, it sounds really good to the people that hear it. It sounds absolutely amazing for those people in the synagogue. They leave that place amazed, impressed with what that new teaching was and what the new teacher had said and done. He preached and taught and spoke and healed as one who has authority. Now, this word authority is an important one in synagogues. The word authority is the Hebrew word simaka, and it refers to the ordination or the recognition of authority or transference of authority. Way back in Deuteronomy, and even before that in Numbers, you can read about how Moses transferred that authority to Joshua. Moses was told by God he was going to die, and he was told to appoint Joshua, son of Nun, as his, as his successor, the, the next leader among God's people. And so God told Moses to transfer his authority by laying his hands on Joshua. And as that laying on of hands that transfers authority and has been done from teacher to teacher to teacher all through the history of the synagogues, all through the history of the teachers of the law among the people of Jews, the Jews. Only rabbis who've been authorized by the laying on of hands were able to interpret the Bible, and particularly the Torah. Without the laying on of hands, you could teach, but you couldn't bring a new teaching. You couldn't give a new interpretation, a new explanation for a Bible passage. Without this simaka, without this authority, this ordination, a teacher could only pass on the judgments, the interpretations of earlier teachers. But when they did receive this authority to teach and to give new, authority, new interpretations to Bible passages, they did so with a, a formulaic saying. It sounds like this. You have heard it said, but I tell you. That sound a little familiar to you? This is a phrase that is not found anywhere in Mark's gospel. Kind of makes sense, probably, because Mark's audience is primarily Gentiles. He was writing in Rome, after all, for the people of Rome and, and the broadly dis dispersed people around the Roman Empire. Matthew, however, was writing for people with a Jewish background, people that knew the traditions of the Jews. And so in Matthew's Gospel, we find this formula again and again and again in something that you might know the best as the Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew chapter 5, you have heard it said to the people long ago, you shall not murder, 
and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who's angry with their brother or sister will be subject to judgment. You have heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Again, you have heard it said to the people long ago, do not break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the vows that you have made. But I tell you, do not swear an oath at all. You have heard it said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. You have heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you. Again and again, this rabbi, Jesus, presents an interpretation of the Old Testament Bible passages that goes deeper, more extensive, that comes with authority because he is telling us very clearly what the intention of God's Word is and how we're supposed to live up to the measure of righteousness, the measure of holiness that God intended, the whole reason the law was given in the first place. Jesus doesn't interpret it so it makes it any less holy or less righteous, but rather lets us see more clearly how holy God is and how high His expectations are for us to live as His holy and dearly loved people. And it's not easy. We can't do it on our own. Not this side of the fall into sin from Adam and Eve. Not this side of Jesus returning in glory so that we live in his presence for all eternity. And so we have this example of Jesus teaching with authority in Matthew's gospel. Matthew includes a lot more of Jesus' teaching than Mark does. And so we don't know what Jesus said in the synagogue in Capernaum that Sabbath day. People were amazed at his teaching. They were astounded by his authority, his interpretation of God's word. Jesus' teaching came with power, convincing power, convicting power, encouraging power. There was some substance there, and they couldn't ignore it. But that's not all. There was a man in that synagogue that day who was possessed by an impure spirit. I don't know what experience you have had with impure spirits. I mean, I recommend you have nothing to do with them, if you can. Because evil, impure spirits are in league with the evil one. They're dangerous. They're malicious towards people. Their main goal seems to be to drive a wedge between you and God, and to make that divide between you and God as big as they absolutely can. Their goal in life seems to take your eyes off of Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, to, to separate you from the love of Jesus Christ. And these spirits are powerful. But part of Mark's good news, part of the, the gospel, is that impure spirits are no match for Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. And this scene at the end of chapter 1, or middle of chapter 1, is not the first encounter Jesus has with the powers of darkness. Mark tells us really briefly that Jesus was tempted when he was in the wilderness for 40 days. Jesus was tempted one-on-one -on -one with Satan after his baptism. Matthew and Luke include a lot more details of this showdown in the wilderness. But Mark simply mentions that Jesus was there for 40 days and was tempted. And then that he came out from the wilderness and started proclaiming the kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe. Maybe you're surprised to read in Mark's gospel that there was an impure spirit in this man who was in the synagogue. It does sound kind of surprising. What would an impure spirit be doing in the synagogue? And yet, maybe the whole world is not a stage, but all the world is part of this battleground between the forces of darkness and God, the Lord of light. There's this ongoing battle between God, the creator, 
and the destructive enemies who oppose him. It's not an equal battle by any means. God could end it immediately. But God lets it continue in order to minimize his losses. God's word says in the New Testament, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promises. I'm speaking about God's promise that Jesus will return. The Lord's not slow in keeping his promises, as some in understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. That's what the delay is in the Lord squashing the evil one and putting an end to the trouble that he causes. And that will happen in the end. We get a glimpse of the final results of this encounter between God and the evil one in this scene from the synagogue in Capernaum. The impure spirit tries to gain an upper hand in this conflict with Jesus, the Messiah, by naming Jesus. He identifies Jesus as the Holy One of God. And this is not worship. He's not praising God. These are fighting words. By saying Jesus' name, he's trying to get a handle on Jesus, trying to wrest control of this confrontation away from Jesus, trying to neutralize Jesus' power by naming him. But that's not happening. First, Jesus silences the impure spirit. Be quiet, he says. He doesn't want his reputation to be built up somehow by the testimony of an impure spirit. That's not the kind of praise or testimony Jesus wants. No, he came to disarm the powers of darkness, to cast them out, ultimately to destroy them. Jesus is not going to leave his creation to the evil one. The people and the planet that he loves are not going to be abandoned to Satan and his rabble. No, Jesus has come to rescue, to redeem, to re renew and restore the people and the world that he loves so dearly. So dearly, he's willing to lay down his life to rescue them. I don't know what you have seen or heard of impure spirits. Some people are really sensitive and very aware of them. And other people seem that they don't notice the evil realm of spirits at all. And I'm not saying that you should go looking for them. Don't mess with impure spirits. They're dangerous. I have seen people who got stuck being involved in dark stuff. That they take directions by asking questions to a, a talking black eight ball. Or consulting Ouija boards. Or horoscopes. Or dabbling in magic or consulting mediums, or attending seances. Often this kind of stuff starts rather innocently. It gets marketed as entertainment, games, and fun. And some people dip their toe into the shallow end around October, around Halloween. And it's a little bit like cigarettes. A lot of people try cigarettes and somehow don't get hooked. But other people get addicted really quickly, get trapped. I've watched as friends of mine got sucked in deeper and deeper by the allure of dark spiritual powers. And here's the attraction. There's real power involved here. And there's a thrill in danger, in walking on thin ice. There's a rush of adrenaline of being in touch with powerful spirits. And they are powerful, make no mistake, but it's malicious power. It's power that's been twisted from its intended purpose, wrenched away from the goodness of God. This stuff is twisted. It's no longer good anymore. Impure spirits and the power that they wield are dangerous. Dangerous for your relationships. Dangerous because they drive a wedge between you and God. Between you and your Creator. It cuts you off from the pure, loving, upbuilding, gracious power of God Most High. Ultimately, evil powers suck the life out of their victims. Stay clear. Don't get involved. Don't even play around with this stuff. It's dangerous. And, of course, there's little sheeps, 
who dress, or those, we, oh, <laughs> I said that wrong. Those wolves that dress up in sheep's clothing, who present themselves as faith healers, as preachers of the gospel. It was a higher profile stuff in the 80s and 90s than it seems to be right now. And some of these personalities became really big and popular in the media. And they damaged the credibility of God's church because they seem more interested in amassing huge personal fortunes and living lavish lifestyles than actually proclaiming the gospel of Jesus or living the way that Jesus himself did. Humbly. Simply. Concerned for their neighbor, his neighbors. Again, these people seem to get sucked in by the allure of power. But it was not a power to do good but of personal power, selfish ambition. A recent story I heard on the CBC radio exposed a fraud from the 1990s, one of these faith healers. He planted actors in the audience, and the stage manager choreographed the whole alleged miracle by whispering through a radio transceiver that he had an earpiece allowing him to get fed details bit by bit so it looked like he was being reve- having things revealed to him by God the Holy Spirit. In some ways, the whole stuff is not that surprising. That even these days, there's this kind of fraud that goes on, pretending to do things in God's name, but manipulating things behind the scenes. This kind of stuff isn't new. You can read about hucksters in the New Testament even who saw preaching the gospel and healing in Jesus' name as a way that maybe they could build up their riches and their fame instead of seeing it as a tangible way to bring glory to God and good news to people who are hurting. That's not Jesus' way, though. Not at all. Jesus is not some kind of money-grubbing, spotlight-seeking miracle worker. He's not casting out impure spirits as a get-rich-quick scheme. It's not selfish gain that motivates Jesus. It's love. It's concern, compassion for people who are hurting, people who are trapped, people who are getting the life sucked out of them bit by bit by bit by impure spirits. He's concerned for people who are suffering oppression, whose life is being stifled by impure spirits. He cares about those who are dominated and tormented by malicious demons. He's pleased to be able to silence and drive out impure spirits. Because this is part of Jesus' plan to rescue the world, to rescue people from the tyranny of the devil. You see, in the synagogue in Capernaum, we see a skirmish in an ongoing battle. The ultimate showdown, though, between the forces of light and forces of darkness take place on a hill outside Jerusalem. The daylight gets interrupted by three hours of darkness, and it looks that day as if Satan and his crew have the upper hand. After all, our rescuer was betrayed by one of his own closest disciples. The rest of his followers abandoned him and ran to rescue their own skins. Even Peter, one of his closest intimate friends, denied that he even knew who Jesus was. So there was Jesus all alone, condemned by the Jews, convicted by a Roman governor, and ultimately nailed to the cross so that he could hang there until he died. All alone, exposed, mocked and scorned by everybody who went by. The power of evil was on display that day. And when Jesus breathed his last and said it was finished, it looked like the forces of evil had won. Except except that three days later, Jesus rose from the grave again. Death was defeated. Evil was destroyed. Jesus is victorious. Because of the power of God, Jesus overcame the worst that satanic forces could throw at him. Without stooping to their level, without abusing his own authority, 
or his own power. Jesus conquered the grave. He arose victorious over sin and death and the evil one. And you get to share in his victory. You get to be part of his kingdom. You get to be part of the team that is victorious over all that opposes God and his kingdom. Mark's good news shows how confession and repentance is part of our allegiance to Jesus, that we renounce any impure or abusive ways, any impure or abusive power in our lives, that we don't want to be involved in things that are twisted and broken, anything that's not motivated by love. You want power? <laughs> don't dabble around in evil stuff. That's dangerous. If you want power, go look to Jesus because that resurrection from the dead, there's nothing more powerful than a human who has been killed who then comes back to life again and ascends to the throne of heaven. You want to see authority? You see how Jesus puts impure spirits back in their place. How he asserts that he is the Lord of life. How Jesus is alive and makes other people alive too. That's real power. Not to suck somebody dry from the power, their power in life, but to give them life and to give them power to shine and flourish and truly live. That's a major part of Mark's gospel about Jesus Christ. An old confession of the church describes it in these ways. How Jesus has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and also sits, sets me free from the tyranny of the devil. He also watches over me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head without the will of my Father in heaven. That's power because that's love and compassion. And it gives life instead of sucking you dry. In Jesus Christ, our sins are paid for, and we have been rescued from the tyranny of the devil. Impure spirits might be powerful, but ultimately they have no power over people who have been protected, rescued, redeemed, renewed by Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And the freedom that we gain in Jesus Christ carries with it a certain amount of power for us as well. Not power that we can abuse or twist, but power to give life to other people. The Apostle Paul writes about this in his first letter to the Christians who lived in a place called Thessalonica. This is what it says. We know, brothers and sisters loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but with power, with the Holy Spirit and deep conviction. This is part of the transforming work that God has in us with this good news of Jesus Christ. That we receive not just words, but receive power. We receive the Holy Spirit. And we are convinced that He is Lord. And that we have life in Jesus' name. And that's what I want you to hear and to experience. More so than being aware of any of the work of evil spirits. I don't want you to be interested in the alternatives, but to carry the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I mean, what did this power of Jesus Christ and the gospel do for the Christians in Thessalonica? A few verses later, this is what it says. Witnesses tell how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead. Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. Enjoy the freedom that you have received in Jesus Christ. Enjoy the life, everlasting life, starting now. And the power to encourage and build up and foster the life in other people and to allow them to flourish and to grow. To speak words that are truthful, loving, kind, a building. And I know that struggles. That's a struggle when we're tired, when we're anxious, when we're under stress. It's hard always to be as kind and as loving as we really want to be. 
And this is where some of that struggle between impure spirits and the Spirit of God is at work really tangibly in our lives. That it takes our reliance on Jesus and on His Holy Spirit. It takes being shaped by His Word and by soaking it in, by reading it regularly, that we get transformed so that we can be loving and upbuilding in our thoughts, in our attitudes, and the words that we say. I heard from a colleague this week who described that in a church that she served. And she was a pastor, and she encouraged people to read through the Bible in a year. And there was one individual in that congregation who was known for having a sharp tongue, known for being kind of discouraging in some of the comments that she made. But as the year went on, and she read more and more of her Bible, people noticed a change in the sharpness of her tongue and in the way that she interacted with other people. This was a person who was being transformed by God's Word and Spirit so that people noticed a difference, that what she said became more loving, more kind, and more upbuilding. It's possible for each of us as we get transformed and shaped by God's Word and Spirit, the power of God becomes apparent, making us more and more like Jesus. We should ask God for that kind of help, shouldn't we? Join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we're really thankful for your Word and for your Spirit. We pray that you will make us more and more like Jesus each day and keep evil, impure spirits far away from us. Protect us from things that suck life from us, that twist our kindness. Help us to be loving and upbuilding in what we say and what we do, not only so that we get a reputation for being kind and, and nice, but so that it brings glory to your holy name and shows the power of who Jesus is and what he's done for us. So that Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, is praised and honored and glorified. Amen. I hope you go out from this worship service encouraged, strengthened in your faith, and ready to take on the challenges of the day and of the rest of the week. But do this with God's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn His face towards you and give you peace. And together we say, Amen. That means it's true.